Welcome to Doxadeo City Changers. such a delight for me to journey with you over the next eight sessions talking about how do we connect Sunday's faith to Monday's life. So many Christ followers see such a separation between their spiritual life and their everyday life, the business world, the world of commerce, the world of their activities of every day. The fact is, we know that Christianity did not just come to make us more spiritual, it came to empower us as humans. And so, in the next eight sessions, we're going to introduce eight key concepts. These concepts are there to challenge, inspire, empower you 
to start thinking about how can you translate your love for Christ, your sense of spiritual development into your everyday work world. And uh, I trust that you will that you will discover kingdom principles that you will be able to embrace and and make part of your everyday life. I trust that you will feel empowered when you have to make decisions and choices in a very relativistic world. I trust that you will sense a greater sense of fulfillment, of calling, of purpose. In essence, that you will deeply understand what we mean when we say you need to become a city changer, a representative of the kingdom of God within your everyday life. Now, in this first session, we're introducing the concept of calling. You know, if you grew up in the church as I did, when we use the word calling, it was always reserved for those who felt that God had spoken to them about engaging in the church in a full-time capacity. And that's true. They are called to that function. But the problem is, if we only give that title to those who are full-time in church, we lose this deep, wonderful sense of purpose in our own lives. As people that are functioning outside of the formal structure of the church. In essence, every Christ follower needs to discover that they are called. And that there is purpose upon your own life. In essence... What that means is you need to connect your faith to your calling. Uh, that means when we talk about calling, the discovery of, of what you were purposed for. See, in essence, the word sin comes from a Greek word, hamartia, which means to miss. The mark. It was used in archery competitions that if somebody missed the target, the people would shout out, Hamartia, you missed the mark. And when the New Testament writers were thinking about capturing a concept that would explain to us what sin is, they took this concept. So in essence, what it means to what sin means, sin is much more than just deeds of things that you do that are wrong. Sin, in essence, means you miss the very purpose and calling of your life. Because you're missing the mark. And therefore, it is important to understand that as you live your life, one of the core references of your being is to discover what is your purpose. What does God want to do not only in you, but through you? And as we grapple with this idea of calling and purpose, this is the question that many times I think leads people down the path of missing to engage with this real purpose. And that is, what are you, in essence, saved for? Now, that's a term that we use in Christian circles, right? You are saved. It means that you've come to a place where you've discovered Christ and your sins are forgiven and, and you recognize that the burden of guilt and shame has been taken off from your life. And now the question is, what do you say for? Many people would off the bat answer that question as to go to heaven. Well, 
In essence, that's true. We're all on our way to heaven. But that is such an incomplete statement. Because that, in essence, was not what you were saved for. You were saved to be able to be introduced to the purpose of God for your life. To find your true identity in Christ. That leads to a sense of intimacy with the Father. And that sets you up for impact in life. And it's critical for us to understand that we are not just saved to go to heaven. Because you see, if, if that's fundamentally what you believe, you will miss the engagement of embracing what you were called for here and now on this earth. And it's within that context that we're, we're recognizing that when we speak about calling, it's, it's about you as a business person. It's about you as somebody in education, in commerce, in arts, in media, in a sports world or, or government or whatever sphere of society you're engaged in. It's fascinating that in the Bible, most of the people that we know as the biblical men and women of faith were not people who were priests. They were not functioning within the context of the church framework. They were business people. They were farmers. They, they, they were people that were functioning in the context of government. Uh, just think about Abraham. David, Joseph, Daniel, Ruth, even Paul was a tent maker. And once you start understanding this, you understand that these people, these giants of the faith, were people that gave expression to the reference of their lives, knowing that they were called to do what they were doing. It's interesting. Many times we separate our, our sense of engagement spiritually and our everyday life. We're very much like the people of Jerusalem. Love Jerusalem. Uh, Jeru Shalom, meaning peace. The city of peace. It was the city of the construct of God. And then there was another city called Babylon. Babylon was everything that Jerusalem was not. It was the city of man, the city of flesh. The Ju people of Jerusalem rejected and despised Babylon. And then the unthinkable happens. The Babylonians come, they conquer Jerusalem, they break down the walls of Jerusalem, and they take the people of Jerusalem all the way, 1,200 kilometers, as exiles to Babylon. Now they're sitting there in in Babylon, at the river of Babylon. And uh, the Babylonians come to them and say, hey, sing us a song. We hear you guys sing such beautiful songs. And, and they respond, by the rivers of Babylon. How can we sing a song in a strange land? Many of you thought Boney M wrote that. But here's the thing. They're saying to the Babylonians, we cannot exercise our faith in Babylon. We cannot exercise our spirituality in Babylon. We cannot express which is precious to us in terms of our spiritual engagement in Babylon. We need a sacred space. And that's when God speaks to them. And he says, I know the thoughts that I'm thinking about you, says the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11, you often quote that. Thoughts of peace, of shalom. And not of evil to give you a hope and a future in Babylon. Verse 7 is where we see how, how God must have rocked their world when he said, Now seek the peace, the shalom of the city to which I have sent you captive. God, you're in this? You brought us here? Yes, and I want you to seek the peace of the city, of Babylon, of this bad place. 
Because in its peace, you will have peace. Suddenly, they discover calling. Purpose. Engaging in Babylon in a different way. Not praying, take me out of this, get me away from this. But now suddenly understanding we are part of this particular reference. You see, redemption is so much bigger than just individuals getting saved from their sin, being freed from guilt and shame. Redemption also has to do with Cosmic restoration. God reconciling all things back to himself. Now, when I recognize that and I engage my everyday life with a sense of calling. What is this calling? Well, it's to bring the kingdom of God. It's it's moving actually from a Limited gospel of salvation to a gospel of kingdom. Remember, that's what Jesus preached. Right through the gospels. You can go see that. Jesus went everywhere proclaiming the kingdom of God. Because you see, Jesus is Lord of all. He's Lord of every piece of reality. He's Lord of education, he's Lord of business, he's Lord of government, he's Lord of all those references. And we are called, we are saved to be the instruments of peace, the carriers of shalom into our everyday Babylon. We do that by taking what Paul references as the three primary components of our ministry, faith, love, and hope. You see, we bring faith to the lost. We bring love to those who are in pain. And we bring hope to that which is broken, that which is lost. In that way, when we start thinking in those terms, we recognize that we are called not just to get people to be saved to go to heaven, but people to discover that they become agents of the kingdom of God in this world right now. And if we do bring faith, love, and hope, we are addressing the spiritual, the social, and the sustainable components of our world the spiritual lostness the social pain and the systemic brokenness that's what we have been called to do just listen to the scripture in Colossians 1 in closing verse 15 he says he's the image of the invisible God this is Jesus the firstborn over all creation for by him all Things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created through him and for him. You join his mission when you become a person aware. On the program today, we are privileged to welcome someone that I've known for many, many years and that's been a city changer in so many ways. Um, Belinda Moser, it's great to have you on the program. I just worked out quickly before we started this uh, interview 21 years ago. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we both still look the same, I believe, yes, after all those yes, years. Yes, definitely. We'll share the secret on another interview, <laughs> won't we? <laughs> yes. um, Belinda, but you've been involved in so many different ways uh, through the years in ministry and through church. Um, and, but today we're talking about soul care. Now, we hear, we hear many words with the word care in it, child care and health care and all kinds of care. But uh, caring for your soul, specific ministry, just tell us where did this start? Well, um, about six years ago, I was introduced to a ministry where 
Um, you facilitate a conversation between God and the person who is in need of restoration or healing of some um, kind. And I think, Dobbs, it was the simplicity of the process that really grabbed my attention at that stage. So I did the training together with a few friends, and then we started practicing the ministry at our Ferry Glen campus. And um, very soon we realized that there is a huge um, need for this kind of ministry. Um, we constantly had bookings six to eight weeks in advance. And then from there, the ministry just mushroomed into many of our other campuses. But Belinda, when people go through a tough time emotionally, spiritually, uh, find themselves at a difficult spot, there have been many courses or processes or counseling through the years that one can't help but wonder what makes this one so special or different. Um, mm. I know it's a complicated thing because sometimes we're scared to engage people because you know, we need to have all the answers and you know, will mm. it really help or work? And some people are involved for years struggling with it. But what makes Soul Care so effective as a, as a ministry to those people in need? Mm. Okay, you know, Tops, it is not so much the things that happen to us in life or the wrong choices we make in life that keep us in bondage as it is the lies that we believe in our non-conscious mind. Okay. Now, whatever is stored in your non-conscious mind determines the way you think about yourself, the way you see yourself, the way you see life, and the way you live life. And soul care focuses on the healing of the non-conscious mind. And the thing is, only Holy Spirit can reveal to us the lies that are established in our non-conscious mind. Mm. And once Holy Spirit brought a lie from our non-conscious mind to our conscious mind, we can actually deal with it. So we renounce the lie and we ask God, um, what is the truth for this specific issue or this specific situation. And then we can start with a process of establishing that truth in our mind. And we know it is the truth that sets us free. It is the truth that transforms the way we think about ourselves and the way we see ourselves. And then from that point, we can start living in the fullness of what God already prepared for us. But that's remarkable because normally, the pressure is on the facilitator of such a process to have all the answers. Yes. But yes. this is different because yes, this is different. you facilitate the conversation between them and God yes. and let the Holy Spirit speak to them directly, which must be like a very new experience to many people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I think that was the thing that um, interested me because, um, you know, for me to think of having someone in front of me who went through severe trauma, or um, abuse was always a very scary thought I because I'm, a, I'm very sensitive to other people's pain and brokenness. I cry in animation movies, <laughs> um, but in soul care, I found a way to help those people. And I still sometimes cry in a soul care session, but now it's different. You know, now I cry sometimes be when I, um, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed by the way God comes and he just showers people mm. with his love and his grace and his compassion to heal them and set them free. Mm. And I think every, every um, soul care session actually changes my life. Mm. When I see something of God's heart for that person being revealed, it touches my own heart and it changes my own heart. But you, you're a witness to God at work in someone's life. Yes. Hey, that's why it's such a beautiful thing to see and yes. will always be. That is an awesome privilege. Yeah. What have you seen, Belinda, this process, soul care, do in the lives of people? You're saying, you've been saying now that you can see it happen there, but I mean, that normally is an awakening moment to some lies that needs to be corrected and truths to be um, accepted and internalized. But what effect have you seen this have um, with the lives of people that's been involved? Mm. Uh, Tops, we obviously have a strict policy of confidentiality mm. for our clients. So I can't share stories, but mm. I, can't, I can share in general. Mm. And I think the most general 
impact that we see um, through soul care is um, the discovery and the restoration of identity. When people hear for themselves from God um, what he thinks about them and how he sees them, um, you see in, right in front of you how, how that changes their facial expressions and their body language. Mm. Um, and you just know that, that, that for that person, it is a brand new start. Um, then, of course, we also see um, regularly people being set free from fear, um, from um, anxiety, depression, addictions, wow. um, bitterness, anger, um, guilt and shame, the occult, um, trauma, um, post-traumatic stress being released in a moment. Wow. Um, we've uh, even seen um, incurable diseases being healed. Um, and then, of course, sometimes we have people who come in who don't know God, mm. and then um, they find salvation Beautiful. in that session. But it's, it's incredible if you think all the things you just mentioned, how many different processes you can access for each one separately, trying to deal with anxiety and yeah. this medicine perhaps, and yeah. with fear and trying to identify that. But the moment people have a conversation with God, yes. who created them, who loves them, yes. then it's the one-stop shop in a way. Yeah. Just connect with your maker. Um, and then yeah. he sorts it out. Hey. Yeah. Oh, uh, Tops, I must say that um, soul care is not a replacement for counseling or even um, professional therapy. Mm, okay. um, but it can work um, very comfortably together with counseling yeah. and with... But um, in a way, it sorts out the root of the problem yes. before you symptomatically try to solve yes. it. Hey? Yes, Lena, it's, right. it's good to hear um, that God is working in such a wonderful, uh, intimate way with His children through the soul care process. Mm -hmm. um, and let's pray together that so many more lives will be impacted, restored, made whole again. Yes. Um, thank you so much for what you're doing. May God bless the ministry. Thank you for your time today. Appreciate it. Thank you.